So welcome everybody to Senate Education. We are Representative Conlin uh, and Representative Bus. I think Representative Bus is going to be able to make it. Representative Conlin, hopefully, if not today, or right at one right soon, we'll get him in a little bit later whenever he's off the floor. But we do have Ledge Council here that can take us through H873. Ms. St. James is a little bit in a similar situation. She might be in and out because they too are going to be on the House floor. Uh, she too is going to be on the House floor dealing with some of these issues So um, that the House is dealing with. So we told her that we would accommodate her schedule. We do have Mr. O'Grady here and uh, who's working to throw things up on the screen. Yeah, before the snow. Anyway, for the rest of the day, I'm going to write that. Let's go back to the ones right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to bring my sneakers. I can't go back. Mm -hmm. Mr. President, please. Thanks. Uh, this is Mike McGrady with the Legislative Council. I'm here to walk you through H873. Um, an act relating to financing and testing for remediation of the presence of poly coordinated five meals in schools. The first thing I want to do is to refresh your memory about why you're here. And you can see that uh, uh, evolution in section two of the bill, page um, six or page five. So you'll remember that um, in uh, 2021 Acts and Resolves number 74, you required that the Department of um, Environmental Conservation conduct indoor air quality testing of all public schools and approved and recognized independent schools that were constructed or renovated before 1980. When you enacted that, you required those schools to be tested by 2024. But the next year, you move that 2024 data up to 2027, turn out of the 2025. And then last year, you move that data out to 2027. In addition, last year in the big bill, you appropriated 29.2, 32.5, depending on how you look at some of the numbers, from the uh, education fund to the Agency of Education for the purposes of establishing a grant program, uh, grants to schools that tested in excess of school action levels for PCBs to investigate, remediate, and remove PCB contamination from their schools. There's been discussion largely in the House about whether or not the PCB and air quality testing program for schools should continue, should it be paused, should it be fully funded? Should it be, um, you know, should it be addressed as a larger universal holistic um, scheme for school construction as a whole? Those are all policy discussions that you all will have, but what the House Education Committee and ultimately the House has done is it will allow for continued testing for PCBs in schools, but with some statements of intent about how it will be funded, how investigation, remediation, and removal will be funded, what will happen if the money at the Agency of Education gets too low to fully fund investigation, remediation, and removal. And then it also takes away the deadline date by which all schools need to test. And I'll come back to that language in a minute. Um, once we go through section one bill. So Mr. Gray, so it's not saying schools have to stop testing. No, it does not say schools have to stop testing, but it says testing will stop if there's $4 million or less uh, okay. at the Agency of Education that's available to do investigation, remediation, and removal grants. Mm. It's like, why test yeah. when you don't have the money 
to do the cleanup and the removing. Uh, don't put the school in the place where they're in a corner and the state has no money to give them. So that's the concept there. So you'll see on page one, section one, sub A, the first thing is there's a statement of intent or statement that if the school is required to test for the presence of PCBs, because some were not, um, that the agency of natural resources shall conduct the testing or pay for the testing. So the testing cost does not fall on the school, it falls on A&R. And they were given $4.5 million in 2021 to do the testing. They've drawn some money from the Environmental Contingency Fund as well, but they, they will be the ones conducting the testing. Then there is a second statement of intent that actually has two statements of intent. In. The first statement of intent is that it's the intent of the General Assembly that um, to hold the manufacturers of PCBs liable for the cost of investigation, remediation, and removal. And there is litigation ongoing to hold those manufacturers liable for those costs. Within, within Vermont or, or not? Vermont. And then prior to any judgment in that litigation, it's the intent of the General Assembly that the state is going to pay for the cost of investigation and remediation and removal of PCBs and the schools that exceed the school action levels. So ultimately you want the manufacturers to pay, but before you get to that litigation award, if you get to that litigation award, then the state is going to pay for the cost of investigation, remediation, and removal. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, we've got litigation. I mean, we have oil, we have this, we have PFAS. We got the money from PFAS. They like so but that's great. Okay. That's also like yeah, yeah. Or sulfur. So, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, Senator Weeks in the same place. Uh if I could. So in that same sentence you just read, it did have a caveat that testing under 2021 acts resolves, you know, et cetera. Does that limit the subset of schools? It does. For first, it's only schools that were built before 2000, right? So, if, and there aren't that many that weren't, but mm -hmm. there were a couple that were built after 2000. Mm -hmm. You don't need to test for them because PCB material couldn't have been used in those, those schools, that school construction. Um, in addition, it limits that subset because that subset is about testing for the indoor air quality. And you'll see later on in this bill, if the school is out there doing construction that's unrelated to the testing indoor air quality and they find PCBs, you're not paying for that. That is their own um, action, their own initiative, and they triggered their, the, the requirements for cleanup on their own. It wasn't something triggered by the indoor air quality test. For example, if you are gonna do site work, pretty much large site work construction anywhere for major construction. You, you do a core sample of the soil and to test what's in the soil, see if there's any hazardous material or other things in it. If you did that core sample and it came back with PCBs in it, the state isn't paying for you to, to clean up those PCBs because it wasn't part of your indoor air quality test. Thank you. Yes, it was. So, can, um... Can schools often not test, even if they even if the A and R has them, they have the funding. So that's that's a that's an interesting question, and the answer generally is no. Underneath existing language, which you will see on page five to six in section two, currently it says all schools subject to the subsection shall test for PCBs on or before July one, twenty twenty seven. Hmm. It says, so that, that reads like the school is on the hook, right? Well, but if you look wider, um, on page six, the oh, line six. two to three. Yeah. So a and R was arguing at one point in the house that if you took away all this money, if you paused the program, the, the DEC testing and the agency of ed funding, that the schools would still be required to test. 
and they'd still be required to test by 2027. So the House is proposing to strike that, that 2027 language. You still have the lead in there that says that, that DEC shall use up to 4.5 to complete air quality testing in public schools and improve recognized schools that were constructed or renovated before 15. So there's still a testing requirement as the schools are not the ones on the hook to do the testing. The ones on the hook are EEC and a and R to do the testing, but there's still a testing requirement. So schools can't really opt out, but the EEC can probably elongate that schedule for what they have left to test if necessary. Interesting. Okay, so it's not what I think I initially thought was some kind of pause or some kind of stop. It's more putting financial, shifting the financial responsibility and allowing DEC to sort of... So so, so there, there is a, a possibility of pause in this language. And you will see that going from page two to page three. And it, in sub C, line five, beginning July 1, 2024, and every month thereafter, A&R reports to Secretary of Administration and to you information about the funds that are available to do investigation, remediation, and removal of PCBs at schools. They first, they first report to you the amount that's at the agency for those grants, whether the funds appropriated are sufficient to fully fund grants to complete investigation, remediation, and removal at schools and when the secretary estimates that those funds will be exhausted. Okay. Uh, Senator Hashim, Senator Williams. Thank you. That's uh, two questions. Would Is anyone able to tell me how much is currently in the fund uh, for remediation? So there was 28.5 that was appropriated. 16 went to Burlington. Um, and so there's, I think the last time I heard there was, there was a little more than six, six, six to seven. And is but that, I have to confirm. So let's put that with the caveat. Uh, and is that spoken for? Is it assigned? No, that's not assigned yet. So the, the, between, so like the, after you subtract 16 from 28, you get like 12. So there's like, then like 5.35. We've, you know, all five to six has been um, committed already. And do you know, you happen to know how much is being appropriated for the upcoming fiscal year? Right now, there's no appropriation that I'm aware of. There's money in the ECF, the Environmental Contingency Fund, that, that you'll see in a minute may be available. Um, but right now, I don't know of any new appropriation to the agency of Ed for the grant. So I think uh, just a quick comment. Yeah. I think my um, this this seems like a dynamic approach uh, a situation, and my I mean at first glance, my only concern is the potential for continuing to leave schools in this sort of unknown area as to whether they should. You know how much time they have to put in to, I guess, mitigating the challenges that come with this. Because you know, aside from you know disrupting class schedules, there's also the challenges that come with you know telling parents and and, and talking to the community. And so it, I just worry about a, a back and forth where it's like, okay, we're going to test. Oh wait, they ran out of money. We're not going to test. But well, let's let's. So A and R T E C has that schedule of testing, and they're reporting to you and the Secretary of Administration about whether or not there's enough funds to do the response, the investigation, remediation, and removal. You'll see that on page three, line 16, if they report that there's four million dollars or less remaining for investigation, remediation, and removal. They shall not initiate testing for payment for initial testing. So it's the initial testing. So they, they have not even been in the school yet to do a plan for testing. So they're not going to do that. They're not going to initiate testing at any school until 
there's a report back from uh, the administration on how to fund this. Um, but if there's a need, you'll see this on page four lines, three to not, three through not. And when the General Assembly is not in session, you're four or below, but the there's a need for more money to, to finish out that investigation or remediation rule. So schools aren't left on the hook. Two million can be transferred from by the E board to Where a, the E board is emergency board. To make sure that those those schools get the grants to do investigation remediation. So the intent is not to leave a school in limbo once they've tested and know that they have to do investigation remediation. But not to test further to put other schools into a, a requirement to do investigation remediation until you know what that long-term financing is going to be. Thanks. To center our sheep's question for the big center. So right now that four million, there's six million in that count. I, that's, All of a sudden two million goes down, goes down two million then. It stops, it right? Stops. Okay. It pauses. And then there's opportunity. You're not in session. Yep. The e board could jump in. The e board throws in two million dollars. Okay. There's the potential for some initial, additional testing at that point. Yeah. Drops below four again. You're going to be back in session by that point. Yeah. And so the e board won't be doing another two million dollar transfer. Um, you'll be back in session, and hopefully you'll have a long term concept for how to pay. Sam Williams. I'll donate those more time to the chairman from Wyndham. If I want to reserve the rest of his time, the next time I have a question. Oh, oh. <laughs> good. Thank you. Sam Gill. Thank you. Um, so I just wanted to chime in on a couple of things. One, uh, you, um, thank you, Ledge Council. You brought up a point about schools, originally, anyway, schools, you know, would test when they had work they were going to do, which is exactly what happened in Burlington, which started this whole cascading effect. We were going to do renovations for our building. We tested and the numbers came up uh, higher than the extremely low numbers that were originally in, uh, you know, that were designated by DEC or ANR or all of the above. Um, so that's what triggered the whole Thing. So that's like a standard process. Um, I also wanted to say that the $16 million that's supposedly going to Burlington has not gone to Burlington as of yet. So that's, I just wanted to clarify that. So, so can I, 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 I'd like to say something on the record on that because I, I had been saying that Burlington hadn't requested it. Um, and it turns out that they did request it. They requested it um, at the end of February. Um, so that's the first request that's been put in okay. for the $16 million, but they have requested it and they have not uh, put in for it. Right. Okay. So it's been requested, but it hasn't actually gone out. Well, I mean, they've only put their request in a little yeah, over a month ago. Oh. And so, and apparently they're working. There might be some disagreement on what needs to be reimbursed. I know. So, do they want the sixteen million? No, we don't want it. At all. <laughs> I mean, why would we possibly want that? Um, yes, we do. And okay, so TBD. We'll look forward to some right. resolution, one way or another, on I, that. I think the agency and the school district are going to have to work through what's going to be reimbursed under. Because remember, it's a reimbursement program. The, all of this, the agency grants any money is reimbursement for investigation, remediation, and removal of PCBs. If it's not related to PCBs, they don't, it's not going to get reimbursed. And so that's part of what I think is going to go on in Burlington about the negotiation of what gets reimbursed up to $60 million. Which I think the school district could probably get there for PCB costs, but it's not going to go to the full. Sure. No, no, no. No, no. There's no, and I would even though PCBs caused it. 
whole thing, they can only use that money for PC. For the cost of right, interest. Well, which brings me to my next point, which is that, as from my experience, removing PCBs is not a simple task. So, uh, when you mentioned they don't want to leave districts in limbo, I mean, the, the whole thing is limbo. So, I'm wondering, can you clarify that a little bit? So, it really depends on what you test for, where you test for it, and what population is exposed in that place. So if it's just adults at a low level in a room that has some ventilation, you probably can do mitigation instead of full mediation. If it's your preschool classroom, the level is going to be lower. The need for response might be higher. So DEC has a the phase level, uh, and that's TEC. Once you hit the federal levels, then you're into mandates and things that you have to do in a certain amount of time. And people will tell you that schools have four years once you hit the federal mandates. That's kind of true. It's on average, it's like four years. But Twin Valley just got a two-year letter. And so they got they were told that they have two years to develop the plan mm -hmm. and one year from the development of the plan to remove it. Yeah. Or remove. Do the feds pay for that? When yeah. it's a federal mandate, the feds don't pay for it? No. Okay. Um a few other things that I wanted to say if I can. Please. Um, one is, is there anything in this bill that touches on the testing program? Because my understanding is, as the, the mitigation, the removal, it's all complicated, but the testing is also complicated. You can go into a building one day and test and get 85, and you can go in two weeks later and get 30. And go, so is there anything in here that touches on the efficacy of the testing? There's nothing really about the testing except removing that deadline date that we already reviewed that schools have to, where it says all schools have to test by 2027. Other than that, the, the action levels, the methodology, frequency, placement, none of that is addressed. But, but having helped do testing of this these buildings, I know exactly what you're talking about. Because you can go into the pink lady at certain times of day and there will be zero. But you go in later in the day after the heat's been running, somebody's racked up the radiator, you're gonna you're gonna get levels. You're gonna get levels of of, of things in the system. And so I understand that and this methodology is supposed to take care of that, but it's not hundred percent. My thank you. My last comment, maybe, um, and I'm not telling any of you anything you don't already know, is that we have the second oldest school building stock in the country. We've we've had a thorough task force process that will ho hopefully be ongoing and continue. We're in a what many folks are calling a financial crisis. So I just have to question again the um, wisdom of investing money in this very aged stock of buildings that hopefully we will be either taking down or improving or whatever it is we're going to do. So I it just, thank you. We have the chair of it who can. Well, I, I was just going to say, he's yeah. probably a better person to talk to that issue than me. I do have a, another question though. Back to Senator Bulick's question about Burlington and funds. So generally in terms of this process going forward, a district applies for the funds at a certain time and those funds that they can get reimbursed for are strictly related to for the investigation, remediation, and removal of PCBs okay. related to indoor air quality testing. If it wasn't discovered as part of the indoor air quality testing program, it is on the school to, to, to handle this. The state is not going to pay for that because the, the mandate, 
the, the program and the funding for it, it all stems from the testing of indoor air quality, right? If the school is going to go out and do its own construction, say, to put on uh, an extension, build a new gym, et cetera, and they do their soil testing, then that triggers state and that can trigger state and federal requirements at that point. And that is not part of the indoor air quality testing program, it's not part of the grant program at AOE. And just of curiosity, do we know how much Burlington has asked for up to this point? If they just put it in a month ago, based on the what they've evaluated, do we know how much they're of that 16 million? So because I erroneously said the last time I was in, I can't even remember what committee I was in, I think it was in Waste Means, I said that they hadn't asked for it yet. Yep. I did my due diligence to find out when they asked for it and how much they asked for it. Okay. They've asked for all 16 million. Yeah. Okay. And it's February 15th. Great. Thank you. Please interview us. I always say I'm never going to speak again. I always do, but uh, I just have to point out. And correct me if I'm wrong, but a scenario by which air quality is tested, it, it triggers a high level, which then triggers remedi medi mediation and remediation, at which point soils are tested. If, if the remediation requires new construction or renovation, the soil is tested and then the soil is high, and that's not going to be covered by this. I mean, it just I just want to point out that that is strange. I don't, I don't know if the state has addressed that issue yet of the cascading effect. If it gets but it's it. it's not beyond the veil. It's that 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 could be something that the state is going to need to look at. Um, you, Twin Valley, might be an example of that where the levels are high enough that the EPA has put in a, someone saying accelerated response plan. And if they're going through their response and they discover that there's more that they need to do, they, they might have to, they might need the money. They might need the money. Other questions from Mr. O'Grady? Representatives Conlin and Voss, it's, Voss, it's completely up to you how you want to do it in terms of your timing, who's on the floor. I know you have a lot. I'll, I'll follow up. Great. Okay. Can you pass that to Mr. Brady? Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Peter Conlin, Chair of House Education. Um, following up on the uh, Council's testimony on 873, the PCV bill. Uh, this really um, sort of provides you all with a, an alternative to the bill that's currently on the wall, which could be stripped of its construction task force language, and which is the straight up pause that we sent you last year. This is more of a trigger, as probably has been explained to you. Um, with the uh, with the Agency of Natural Resources commitment to continuing the testing using uh, additional funds from the uh, from from some of their solid waste funds. Uh, we became increasingly concerned that if the testing continues and there's not a pause put on, that the money that's set aside aside from the broken money could be used up real fast. And uh, so this is really meant to be a trigger to stop the paw, to stop the testing, when that money available for mitigation, remediation, and abatement hits $4 million. Uh, I offer it to you as something, as an alternative. However, uh, I think that the number should be looked at very carefully. I'm not sure that that the dollar amount, the dollar amount. I'm not, I, I think four million is probably too low. It's currently sitting at seven point one million. Um, but just to just to um, do the quarterly testing of the schools that are out there, if you're talking probably in excess of two hundred thousand dollars, 
Uh, and you said that again? Yeah, just to do the quarterly air testing, because those who have, who have tested and have tested above the school action level have to be tested at least quarterly. Some, there's even some interim testing involved in addition to the quarterly testing. For example, at North Country, that's $80,000. At Bellows Falls, I think that's uh, high 60s for Porter. At uh, Green Mountain Union High School, I think it's about 40. Uh, Twin Valley, I'm not sure about. At Twin Valley, I would really recommend you have folks come in. They have now rung the bell of the EPA, which everybody else will eventually. And they are now under a two-year order, I think, to uh, fully evade the PCBs as a result of the indoor air testing. So that's the basic concept here is to, just to basically say, all right, well, at least when, at least when it reaches this level, we got to stop if we're not going to just all out the stuff. Uh, I, I, I am frankly very concerned that the um, dollars, even as they exist today, do not match our commitment in Act 78 last year that said that the state would not turn this into an unfunded mandate. How did you reach the $4 million? To a, to a certain extent, we pulled it out of the yeah. air. Okay. Questions for Representative Todd? Uh, if you're going to worry. Oh, okay. okay. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah, please. Yes. So, can I do this to you? Go ahead. No, 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 please. My question is a simple one, I think. Um, in your research estimation, testimony, wisdom, et cetera, um, I think you would prefer that we, we take up a bill that's sitting on the wall as opposed to this one, but this is a backup. I would say having having been now, I've been now visited the schools, talked with people there, this Twin Valley situation is brand new, um, then I think, yeah, sure, you have pots in the program. We, and as quick as possible is probably a better way to go. Senator Weeks. So just for clarification, I believe you've said it, but just want to make sure I understand. So that the $4 million trigger, do you believe, is it the expectation that the $4 million residual would be enough to continue, you know, would be enough for remediation of what's found? At that point, or it's I, just a trigger to stop additional testing. It's a trigger to stop additional testing. I would say the answer to your question is uh, I'm not personally confident, but I think it's a huge question mark. So, for example, U32 just got started into the investigation. They triggered school action levels. Who knows what that's going to find? While investigations go on and on at these schools, and really nobody other than Twin Valley has hit even the point where the where they got to have a plan. Um, testing continues. So you never know what you're going to find in the next school. And I guess I remain concerned that anything could turn up at any time that could wipe this money out very quickly. So, and, and I will, I just will, will point out that I would say that the, the General Assembly and the administration may have a different idea of what was meant in Act 78 last year. I think that the um, Agency of Natural Resources is operating under they, what they think is, is the correct solution, which is to mitigate, i.e. perhaps run fans, uh -huh. until such time as either the EPA, which is a four-year deadline, says you got to do something now, or you do a renovation project. Um, in their testimony, they said, well, we feel we can work with our federal partners, and that four years is maybe flexible. I think the situation in Twin Valley may say exactly the opposite. Um, and, and, and just that, that, you know, I saw Act 78, the language you have in there, as saying, we're committed to not having these costs fall on the, town, on the school districts. I think if you're talking about mitigating for seven years, 10 years until you do a, a, a renovation, if you even have one on the books, I, I'm not sure if that's a, a, a very good situation. That is right. If you want to take a field trip around to any of the schools that are running these fans, 100 fans, 24 7, see what it's like. Were we supposed to get a report back from, from the testing of the first phase of testing you already went through? I think, you know, it, whatever you want to know is probably available on the Agency of Natural Resources website, wherever that information is. Rats, maybe the Department of Education or Agency of Education, I'm not sure which one. Because in, in my district, I had quite a few principals came to me when it first started that just wanted to stop. That's why I asked the question. Yeah. Uh... 
Peter, does this represent, in part, something the agency was pushing for also? No. No, OK. Uh, I, you know, I think that, that they have a strong desire to keep the testing going. OK. Um, this, but, but, the, uh, but this plan, uh, in testimony, the administration signaled that they would oppose it. Got it. The administration would not oppose this. That's right. Yeah. They, they may have some differences of opinion on the $4 million. Anything else? Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate your time. Representative Buss. Thank you. Hello there. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. Representative Tesha Buss uh, from Woodstock, Plymouth, Reading, and the House Education Committee. Thank you so much for having me today to talk about BOCES. Yeah. We're told that the name may change. The what name, year? yes. We, okay. we did discuss the name a little bit. Uh, I know that the administration, or the agency, excuse me, would like to potentially have it changed because in other states, um, BOCES uh, is responsible for a governance structure for career and technical education. Right, right, right. And so it might come across confusing. Um, I don't think the House Education Committee, uh, we did not discuss it enough, nor do I think we're particularly tied to the name. Yeah. It's more the, the nuts and bolts of what it is that we can do with it. So it would be incredibly helpful for those of us that haven't followed this work Tell us sort of the problem it's trying to solve. Yes. That would be great. So, uh, the executive director of the Vermont Superintendents Association stated in our committee a couple of weeks ago, when speaking about superintendents and school board members, he said that they need to look to themselves for leadership as well. And so this bill gives school boards and superintendents the ability to lead from within. So you may be asking, well, what is a BOCES? A, a BOCES is a collaborative that allows supervisory unions to pay a fee for sort of service in order to operate at scale and reduce the duplication of services. We are not new to this uh, particular um, form of established, uh, to create an established system. In fact, we're one of only nine states in the United States that does not have an established system. So. Here's what a BOCES can do. We all want to do uh, bulk purchasing of paper, technology, uh, tables, chairs. Um, that would be able to happen, not just um, in one BOCES, but there could be the ability to offer that service to any supervisory union in the state if that was your specialty. We're like, we know our tables and chairs and everyone just would contact them and get their tables and chairs right there. There could be a member price, there could be a non-member price. So that is one way. Uh, federal grant writers, we all know how expensive those are. They require a very specific expertise and skill set. There's no reason why we need to have them in every supervisory union, nor is it even really possible. So. Uh, if there's a BOCES, let's say it's in the southeastern part of the state, they've got that person nailed down, great, everyone just contracts a fee-for-service um, with that particular grant writer. Right, Buss, may I just interrupt while you're on that? Sure. So one of the things we had hoped uh, wraparound schools, community schools would do is that the schools that really needed it the most would get those dollars. Sometimes what happens is it's the schools that have the time and the energy, like you're describing, to write these grants and the, and the people, you know, the power behind it to do it. Would this create any kind of conflict in any way, having that sort of the grant writers all in sort of one area, even though it might benefit, might not benefit that particular area? And it, you may have just given it as an example to say that could happen, but it could always happen in other ways as well. Let me start by saying this is brand new, so yep. we may find issues that come up in the okay. future, and we may have to visit this legislation because it's uh, whenever you whenever you start something new, there's going to yep. be a, a trial and error, and edits definitely needed. However, to speak off the cuff um, about it, I actually think it could be equally helpful 
because everything is then funneling through one grant writer that's writing that grant um, to the, the federal government. And so it's going to provide a lot of ease and proficiency. Um, that federal grant writer will be able to kind of see the, the very nature of all the, the different applications and how they differ from rural districts to potentially greater populated districts and to truly be able to bring um, to us, to the agency, here's really how diverse the skill set is and here's how we probably need to, to step up to assist to provide greater equity throughout our state. That is my dream. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Good. Senator Williams, you want to ask? So who's going to be the referee? Make sure that the schools of you get the grants for So it would be a fee for service. So there's no referee involved. Oh. If you want to pay, you get to play. Okay. And if you think that you are particularly, uh, I mean, I think that's also the reason why it's great. The community school model is a, that's only one type of grant uh, example, but um, that is, I mean, I guess what you're saying is, is that if what if that school doesn't have the ability to pay for that grant writer, sh uh, he or she, uh, whoever the grant writer is, will be less expensive if they're creating all of the grants. That's for sure, because it'll be the same grant that they're writing to the feds. So there will be um, that cost savings. Senator Hershey. Uh, thank you. I'm, I'm curious about, you know, what, what does this bill allow SUs to do uh, that they're not currently able to do. Uh, and, and the reason I ask is, you know, I'm looking at shared programs and services, and I'm thinking of, you know, CTEs, for example, of, you know, a student going to another school that's in a different area to access a program, uh, things like that. And, yeah, so what does this do that SUs can't currently do? Great question. So right now, you may have a person that comes into a school and they are a 0.25 FTE because they are providing art services or they're providing um, some special education services. And then they really need full-time employment. So that school has to figure out, well, how do I make up the other 0.75? So in this particular instance, if you've got a number of particularly rural schools even, um, that all need that 0.25 FTE doing that exact same thing. Right now, they each have to have an individual contract for employment, which means they can technically collaborate because they're utilizing that person to do four different jobs to make up full-time work, but the employee doesn't get the benefit of full-time work. The BOCES could hire that uh, particular person and say, all right, here, you're gonna go do serve this contract in all four um, schools, but we're going to be your employer. They, uh, ABOCES can be a public employer. They are body politic and corporate, so they can organize. They can provide health insurance, and as well as be a, a part of the teacher pension plan. And for those um, employees that are not a part of the providing education services, then it's the um, municipal type of um, supports. Thank you. You're welcome. Sorry. So, uh, what's the where's the main engagement? Is it is it a state level organization or is it a uh, regional? Is it the SU? Yes, great question. So this is one of the things we struggled with with the most, and this is what I would certainly encourage you uh, to spend a bit more time on is where do you draw the lines? So we were we received in testimony draw lines and put a cap on it because in states that did not choose to do that, they had a very strong number of BOCES and that became untenable and, and expensive, right? Because what we tried to do in Act 46 is to reduce this. Um, so we were, uh, we were brought a very non-official map from the superintendents about how they divided up the state into regions and they collaborated during COVID. And from that, we also talked about, well, Chittenden County, because it has a, an exceptional amount of the population, might need to have an extra BOCES um, to service regionally. And perhaps we need one more for the, oh boy, we haven't thought of that problem yet. So that's why we put seven in the bill. 
Now, one thing I want to mention, seven that we put a, a cap of seven yeah. doses okay. statewide, and we were very flexible about the language, so the Secretary of Education would uh, have to approve the creation of a BOCES. Uh -huh. And tip its hat to, does it satisfy the regionality of our state? Is basically, is it, do we have, if, if three are trying to get started just in Chittenden County, well, then we're not representing statewide. So, but we also didn't know if we wanted to draw really specific geographical boundaries. Um, because one of the things that, that really made me excited about this bill is I'd like to provide an example in my district. Um, we started a, a program called the Options Program, and this is for um, special needs and extraordinary special needs. And they, they need to be kids that need to be out of the classroom. And right now, we have very few state placement options. Mm -hmm. Going out of the states, $200,000. In the states, $60,000 per kid, sometimes $30,000 to transport them. Sometimes it's residentially based and the whole family has to move. These are problems that we really need to solve that the BOCES can do. So we, uh, with another district, rented space at our local recreation center, transportation, the teacher and the parent educator for 15 to 20 students annually runs us about 15,000 per child. And they're close enough to get reintegrated back into the classroom. So we have a lot of language in here into the purpose section about you know, least restrictive environment to make sure that they aren't shipped away to the options program and then stay there forever. The goal is to give them the skills to reintegrate. Um, so that would be a great example of why you would want it want them regionally, but that same BOCES that's doing that regional could be the one that houses the grant writer that everyone in the state needs to access, which is the reason why you want a fee for service that might be membership based or non-membership based. So if you created that options program and you put money down to rent that space and hire those educators, you're going to want a member price because you've got skin in the game. But if you hired the, uh, the grant, if you just want the grant writer service, um, you didn't put any skin in the game, well, your price might have to be a little bit higher because you didn't um, contribute up front to be a member. But you can, let's say that you're in the Northeast Kingdom and you're like, I'm good, I don't need a BOCES for anything, we're not close enough to any other schools to collaborate, but I only want that grant writer. Well, I don't need to be a member of any other BOCES except for the grant writer BOCES. So I'm just gonna become a member of that so I can get the lower price. We wanted it to be super flexible. I'm giving you like a, a lot of options. Mm -hmm. um, and, and these are just examples. But um, we just felt like it really helped people to be nimble like that. And to not have all of the options and guardrail. We, we wanted to put enough guardrails there to be safe and efficient and effective, but not to restrict anyone from getting the services that they really need. Give another question. Well, it Yes, sir. Miss St. James said that this was uh, heavy. And yeah. We carved out time so we can sort of figure this out because we don't right. have a lot of time. Right. Um, so, one, two. Two questions. Uh, so obviously, this needs to happen legislatively. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. Uh, you know, people can't coordinate right now in these areas, like Senator Week said, unless you know, legislative action would ha needs to take place. Uh, yes and no. Okay. So while it is possible, yeah, there are many sense. benefits to it right. being legislated. Right. So um, it provides this bill provides a minimum requirements for the uh, articles of agreement, which becomes the operating agreement. So it makes sure that all the BOCES are on a level playing field from an agreement standpoint, from a, from a legal uh, creation standpoint. It also makes sure that they have a website. On, on so the that, same level as each other or, or with whom? Uh, with each other. Okay. So um, it would make sure that everyone has the ability to have their teachers um, be a part of the retirement plan. So all of those types of things are in this enabling language. I'm not for sure that that would have to happen if one SU just partners with another SU and they create a cooperative that isn't sort of regulated. I'm not for sure how their 
ability to provide those protections for their employees could exist. Um, so that that's part of it. But the ability for there to be um, websites and for this to be on the Agency of Education's website so that everybody knows the services are available and where to find them is also really important. Right now, you would just have to do a bunch of Google searching to find out um, who does what, where. So um, who, who do the BOCES report to? The district or the AOE? Or? That's a great question. So the board members, so if, you, if, if a, this SU wants and this SU want to collaborate, they can either do that through providing a member that is uh, appointed by the supervisory union or a school board member. And then they make this collaboration and then there are uh, there are reports that are sent back that specifically have to address whether or not they are servicing the needs that they joined forces to solve in a cost-effective manner. So it's not so, directed. It's like self-spawn. Exactly. <laughs> so it's not top-down. So if I may. Um, in any way, does it discourage merging? Could it discourage merging? I mean, one of the things with Act 46, again, we were, we're in this moment, as you well know, we're looking at our schools, we're looking at school size, all that kind of thing. Act 46 uh, looked at governance, but with that governance, I would say there was a hope that people would say, all right, we will now, um, with one school board, more control over looking at our elementary schools, and okay, we have five, but only one, one of them has 10 kids in it, and we're going to, and it's not a great building, so now we're gonna have four. In any way, does this sort of discourage that kind of thing. I'm not saying it's a bad thing one way or the other. I'm just wondering your thoughts. Um, well, these are the thoughts of Tisha Bus, not yeah, that yeah, yeah. we heard from the committee yeah, at yeah. all. Um, to be honest with you, I think it could go in both directions. Okay. Um, you know, you're providing an ease for sometimes our smaller schools to get more services. And at the same time, you are getting connected to. Um, you're connecting more with a, a system that might be providing services all over the state for you to see what you're missing. Okay. And I think e I think they both are equally important. Senator, you said in the bill there's a. And I apologize. I haven't, I haven't read it completely yet. Uh, but there was a limit of seven OCs. Yes. And those are kind of generated by topic or ex subject matter expertise or. Why, where did the seven come from? So the seven came from the five regions of the state that uh, the superintendents used during COVID, okay, plus right. two more to be nimble. And they're not directed at all. So they are very uh, self, they will be self-created and evolving um, entities. Okay, and then can you characterize uh, AOE's reaction to this concept? They uh, certainly have been favorable um, to this concept, for sure. Um, they did have a question about the name sure. because of the career and technical education uh, perspective, and um, and the number still puzzles us all. So we decided to put seven out there to create the two nimble uh, ones and, and just move forward. Because no one's really for sure, but there's no one stopping uh, someone, uh, a superintendent, to come to the legislature next session or whenever this gets enacted to say, hey, here's what's happening in the field and let's make an adjustment. Yeah, Senator Williams and Beckson. So I'm just thinking about, you know, how, how is this equitable? I mean, if, if BOCES can merge for the, for the benefit of those schools, and the other ones can't afford it. How is it going to be fair and equitable across the state? 
Well, I actually think that it reduces costs for the service that they would probably need to provide anyway. So let's say you're doing professional development in um, scientific or evidence-based literacy, and you need to do that for your kids. And uh, you know your teachers are saying, we need coaching, we need coaching, we need coaching. And your, your school looks at providing that contract all by themselves. They may not be able to afford it. The BOCES might be the only way they can afford it. Because if they are contract, we have one county that has 12 contracts for the exact same service. Wow. Interesting. Okay. So you know, then you get an economy of scale. Even if it's a 10, 15 percent reduction, we'll take it. Yeah. Sam Weeks. Uh, yeah, a couple questions. So first, it, this invokes the whole um, uh, concept, and we talked about it offline, of BRAC. In the military, where we took bases and we, we we did exactly the same thing, whether it was contracting or command structures or firefighting services, whatever, and we consolidated. So, so I get the concept, fully support it, but I'm always leery when a bill is more than three pages long, because then I know it came from somewhere. Oh, so I'm curious: is this really a AOE genesis? You know, is this something, or is this something that? Do, uh, not that I'm aware of at all. And in fact, they didn't even come in to testify until we were quite far <coughs> along with this bill. So little in the fact that we were actually um, surprised when they did show up because we were like, where have you been? Uh, where have you been all my life? Um, but I personally uh, studied quite a bit the enabling language because I've created other nonprofits and I wanted to make sure that we had some consistencies and I've run into some conflict of interest issues in the nonprofit world. Um, so I definitely did a deep dive with a lot of research that uh, our wonderful legislative council brought to the table and, um, and she was excellent to work with. So no, this is not AOE uh, okay. generated. And then just a question on kind of mechanics. Uh, it, it sounds like a school would need to predetermine the level of engagement in the BOCES the year before as they develop their budget. For example, if they were going to, if they recognize or they thought they would need uh, grants, they would say, okay, we need um, whatever, uh, you know, 0.25 FTE for grant writing for the year 2025. The school or the district? Well, whatever the, the, yeah, the individual school or the, Whoever, at what level? The individual school then fleets it up to the district who fleets it up to the boats. I don't know the mechanism. But I'm just saying that it sounds like, my point is that we have to, it sounds like we're predetermining engagement kind of a year before. Mm -hmm. So to your point, you were talking about coaches and what have you, but in this case, um, yeah, I'm just curious if that's kind of what's, because a boats you can't just sit around, you know, fat, dumb, and happy waiting for people to call them because they've got manpower on stage. They've got manpower, right? They, they have to know, okay, how many, uh, how many, you know, what staff do they need to go up to to support all of the various requests? Or they got to kind of wing it the first year and find out what the level of engagement is before they adjust then for the second year and increase their staff, decrease their staff. You absolutely have a full handle on the precariousness of getting this started, okay. for sure. The answer is, uh, I don't think that they're absolutely going to know when they come out of the gate. They're going to uh, be taking some risks. They'll bring somebody on board. I mean, one of the like, as my business hat um, sits on my head, this gets me super excited and twitterpated about the fact that like you're going to have a business person in charge of making sure that as many people as possible has the thing that you offer as your BOCES. So if it is evidence-based, um, scientific uh, um, coaching for our educators so that we can increase literacy scores. You are gonna call every supervisory union in the district, and you're gonna, I mean in the state. And on top of that, you're gonna say, the more that joins, the, the lower we can make this cost. You don't have to, you don't have to worry about it. We have vetted this program. We're seeing success already in a certain supervisory union. They've already increased their literacy scores. You don't need to work so hard on that curriculum or spend 
all that money buying it and then you get it and you don't like it, mm -hmm. um, somebody's already working with it and is loving it and is seeing results from it. So that part I think is really exciting and we don't operate that way these days. We operate in a lot of silos and I think yeah. that that's just speaking to the merger perspective. Like will it? like? Maybe we've made it too easy for them not to, but we've also made it in a in a way that they're collaborating where, where they might actually want more. Yeah, Senator uh, Gill. <laughs> Where's Senator? Lynch? She always gets her way. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so I'm going to ask a question. It's a hypothetical because it's not going to be a popular one, but I'm just going to ask it. Why not just go directly to having fewer districts with fewer, maybe fewer overhead, fewer school boards. Like, why not just, like, do that? This is also my personal opinion, not a representation of the House mm -hmm. Education Committee fully, but um, I think that as we move forward, there's going to need to be a lot of political will. Mm -hmm. um, and until that vision solidifies, this provides a great path towards certainly collaboration and cost savings. Thank you. I'm going to be a little more blunt. So you said that these policies are nonprofits. I, I really, right? No, uh, I've created a lot of nonprofits. Okay, okay. So these, who's funding the, the most AOE? No, so the BOCES, uh, you would, if this supervisory union and this supervisory union say, hey, let's create this BOCES, they're taking their money to provide uh, the startup. So they're going to put the skin in the game, and they're going to hire whoever's needed. That might be an executive director. They may just say, well, we're going to come together. Um, this superintendent's going to say, we're going to, we have a great treasurer. All right, so we, we've got the financial part covered, and we're just going to hire this one person. Or they could say, well, we want to hire an executive director that oversees all of this, and they pay the salary. That's the reason why there would be a member and a non-member difference, potentially, in um, cost or fees. And maybe at some point, uh, once they get enough going, and there's enough that's coming out of that BOCES, they may choose to reduce that and maybe make no, not, no changes to member or non-member. We didn't restrict them to anything there. But yes, it is very, very self-directed. And one point that you made earlier that I wanted to speak to or question was, you know, a lot of times your supervisory union already has line items in the budget for expenses that they have to, you know, they already know that they're going to spend some on professional development. They already know they're going to spend money on curriculum. So that may not be incredibly directed just because the BOCES is created. It might just be a, oh, great, we don't have to vet this. We don't have to do this research on our own. We just saved, uh, you know, 20 hours of research time. Great answer. And I, and I, I get it, but I think so. Back to my question about equity. You're going to have some that are going to do it well and some that aren't. And so you're going to always have a school district maybe that is paying more because they didn't they didn't put the right puzzle together. Um, and we sometimes I think that you know I'm, I'm more of a top down sort of person. Uh, when you leave it up to the to the individuals to put together their own organization, then that organization will probably prosper, and the rest of them maybe not so much. So. I, I just want to make sure that everything is equitably uh, distributed. It makes sense to have people have you know be in charge of their own destiny, for sure. And it's that budget money drives it. So, but I'm just looking for some kind of safeguard, keep them in, give them some guardrails to keep them in order, to make sure they take advantage of what you're talking about. I think that's an excellent point. Um, I do think it helps a lot of uh, schools that are less resource get the resources right. that they need. Um, but I can also see that if they need the resource of the extraordinary special education um, system, uh, that that might be challenging. But it sort of gives them a mentorship model to see how other uh, 
how other supervisory unions have done it in a, in a more transparent and easily accessible way than ever before. But that might be one of the things that they come back and say, like, we need to, we need to help them. Oh, and you did ask about formulate for, uh, money, which is that we um, allocated $70,000, $10,000 per BOCES to get stood up. That would cover um, legal fees for drafting the Articles of Agreement, which becomes their um, organizational document, but then also to create a website that lists their services and um, whatnot and get it started. Plus, is that in the budget? Did, did the House pass? Uh, yes, we passed that. But that's in the budget. It, did it, St. James Office of the Legislative Council, the appropriation is in the bill itself. Oh, it's, that's right. It's from the Ed Fund. Okay. That's right. I remember we had some involvement. Can I, can I back up just, uh, it, just yeah. to make sure I understand? So, Rep. Bus, are you good on time? Because we're going to try to keep it as long as we can, even after the walk. I'm either sitting oh, here or on the House floor. Right, right, right. Right. I would sweat. love to be able to get to the point at the end of the day that this is getting close to being baked. Okay. Or, I mean, we'll hear from folks, but I'd love yeah. to really make sure the committee is ready to roll. Okay. So you being here is huge. Okay, great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you okay, so seven, but this is say theoretically, seven BOCES, okay, distributed across the state. Are each of those BOCES uh, uh, essentially, potentially duplicating their effort to, like, they all deal with procurement consolidation or they all deal with special ed education con uh, consolidation? Or is one BOC, like, the subject matter expert on procurement for the state, and everybody, everybody uh, emulates them or uses their services or what have you? What, which perspective is it? Uh, I think the answer in this very initial stage is both. It, if somebody is already coming out of the gate saying, we do procurement, then another BOCES, if they wanted to create to do procurement, would have to really wrestle with why or why them. Because they're going to be in literal business competition now. And so, that kind of also brings in a, a new uh, flavor into the educational realm. Um, because they're going to try to get as many people to use their services to make it cost effective, as, and, and so is the other. So unless there is extremely divergent principles behind why there needs to be something different, um, I, w I would see that folks would very much uh, have pause to do the same thing that somebody else is doing. That's perfect. Thank you. How are we going to share information? So, I mean, because I I've seen school districts that say, "Gee, this this supervisory union is doing it this way. Why don't we go find out how they did it?" If you got if you cut this biggest problem in Vermont, I I see are drain lines of communication. If if there was some way that they had a website in the sky that said, "This is what we're doing." Because you're kind of you're kind of allowing everybody to do their own thing. Right. Yes. Right. So right now you would have to Google and research each supervisory union. That's over fifty, right? Um, now there'll be seven maximum websites that you would go to okay. for each BOCES to see what services they offer. So I think it would actually streamline the the process of figuring out who the, who's already doing what well. If it works for you, we're going to take a five minute break. We're going to have Ledge Council take us through the bill. Great. We're going to have probably a bunch more questions if you can stick with us. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Morgan, five minutes. Great. So, welcome you back to Senate Education. We are now going to do a walkthrough of page 630, uh, 22 page bill. And uh, this is an act relating to boards to cooperative educational ser education services. We may lose Miss St. James to go to the floor. If so, we'll recess at that point and then come back to it so we can finish this today. Ms. St. James. Thank you, Beth St. James, Office of Legislative Council. So you have H630 as passed by the House in front of you. It starts with a findings section. Do you want to go through those findings or do you want to skip to the meat of the bill? Me. Me. Okay. Okay. One word. Um, so we're going to go to page four. Section two. 
And what section two does is it adds a brand new chapter to Title 16. Oh my. What? I'm sorry, I can't unsee what There's I just saw. Showing it. There's a fish out the window. Fish and wildlife. Oh, Wildlife. Wildlife. Um, excuse me. Uh, so sturgeon. Sturgeon. It is. Yeah. Um, so it adds. So section two adds a brand new chapter to Title 16. Correct. Called the Board of the Cooperative Education Services. So this is the BOCES chapter. And then within the chapter, there's a whole bunch of different sections. Starting. This is a completely new chapter. Completely new chapter. Starting with section 601, which is a policy section. So we're on page four, line three. Um, I am not, I'm going to try my best to not go line by line, but this is a dense right. bill. We so we right. may yeah. end up That's fine. doing that. Um, so I do think it's important to read the policy. Mm -hmm. It is the policy of the state to allow and encourage supervisory unions to create, and I'm just going to say BOCES. Okay. To provide shared programs and services on a regional and statewide level, formation of a BOCES shall be designed to build upon the geographically focused cooperative regions used by Vermont superintendents as of July 1, 2024. So that is what Rep. Boss was talking about, those um, kind of informal regions. That's the reference. That's the one reference to that. Um, they shall be designed to maximize the impact of available dollars through collaborative funding and reduce duplication of programs, personnel, and services and contribute to equalizing educational opportunities for all pupils. So you're gonna see later on that the secretary has to approve the articles of incorporation or the articles of agreement of a BOCES. And the secretary needs to find that formation of a BOCES is in alignment with this policy. So this policy is important legislative intent language for the rest of the bill. Committee, questions about that? Just uh, one for Rep. Bus, if I may. The geographic, that map, do you have it? Did you already describe to us? Oh, you do have it. I knew you could. Thank you. She rocks. That is awesome. Can you get copies of that? So one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, yeah, do you mind? Do you mind doing it in color? Yeah, yeah. Oh, the color is key. Yeah. Um, okay, so I had that question. And then this is for the council. Is there there's nothing else in statute prior to the creation of this that allows these kinds of things to happen? Um there's no yes or no answer to that question. So what there is in statute right now, and you'll see as we walk through, what a BOCES is, is it's a, a, its own body politic incorporated, its own political subdivision of the state. Mm -hmm. So it's got a payroll, it's got employees, it is carrying a budget, it has expenses, it is offering services. There is nothing in state law that currently allows for an SU and an SU to get together or a dis school district and a school district to get together and become a political subdivision of the state and offer this. They could get together and form a nonprofit that is a nonprofit entity the same way that any other nonprofit entity is, right? And there are um, there are some cooperatives the House Education heard from some education cooperatives that are currently functioning in the state, but they are their own nonprofit. Current state law does allow for supervisory unions to have joint agreements. So 16 BSA 267 allow for SUs to enter into a joint agreement to provide joint program services facilities and professional and other staff that are necessary to carry out the desired programs and services. Um, but that joint cooperation contract or agreement would still mean that one of those SUs is carrying the employment contracts, the um, uh, the line item on a budget for the services that they have agreed to share. 
they get they might get paid back from the other supervisory unions, but there's still a line item on that SU's budget. With a BOCES, the line item on the BOCES would be the or a line item for the supervisor union would be membership fee or the money they are paying for the services for their individual supervisory union. They are not carrying the cost of providing the service to everyone who's involved in the BOCES. It's the BOCES who's, who's looking to be made whole by the SUs contributing. Does that kind of make sense? So right now, under state law, Yes, supervisor unions can get together and they can form joint agreements. Um, but one of those SUs, or they have to have some apportionment of who's who's paying that who's paying that bill, and how are they getting paid back by the other SUs that are sharing those services, right? But the BOCES, the BOCES is just so. For example, let's say you had an art teacher. Yeah. Okay. And there were five SUs who only needed an art teacher for 0.2 time, right? Yeah, that's a lot. Right? Yeah. So under current law, under um, section 267, those SUs could get together and agree that they were going to provide art services together. They were going to make sure that their schedules didn't conflict with that one art teacher so that she, he or she could go around and do 0.2 in these five different services. One SU has to be the employer, right? Potentially. Mm -hmm. You could get lucky and have a teacher be willing to do a point two contract in all of these. You might have the SUs get together and decide we're going to take on the, the one and then everyone pays us back, right? With the BOCES, the BOCES would be the employer. And then each supervisory union would be paying for however much, 0 0.2, 0 0.75, whatever amount to pay back, however they're using that feature. Same for transportation costs. <laughs> Let's say under section 267, some SUs got together and they decided to do a joint contract for transportation because they, you know, economy of scale, they could get a better deal. One SU is on the hook for that whole bill. And then their agreement would parse out how much each U is paying back to that the, the contract holder. Under a BOCES, it would be the BOCES that holds that contract. And then each SU would be then paying for whatever service they needed or wanted from that contract. Does that make sense? It does. It does. So, yeah, under current state law, supervisory unions can get together and form joint agreements. But I understand now the complexity of them doing it that way rather than doing it this way, which, uh, yeah, I mean, I still have some more questions, but it I, seems like a really good step. Okay, so any more questions on policy before we go to definitions? Great. Page four, line 12, section 602, very short definition section for this chapter. So you'll see on line 13 is used in this chapter. Um, we're defining, we're going to use the, instead of saying teacher and administrator, teacher and administrator, we're going to say that the term educator encompasses both teachers and administrators who are licensed under chapter 51. And then on page five, line six, Supervisory union, we're just making it clear here that a supervisory union also includes a supervisory district, so we don't have to keep repeating that over it. Section 603, line 10, page 5. Here, now we're starting to get into um, the real meat of the bill, right? The creation of for the cooperative educational services. So subsection A, how are these boards established? So two or more SUs, they have to meet to discuss the advisability of entering into a written agreement to provide shared programs and services. Can the SUs, could it be a lot more? Could it be five? Could it be 10? It's two or more. Two or more. Yep. Up there, just Yep. 
And then at that meeting, or if it takes five meetings to come to an agreement, they can enter into an oppo a proposed agreement to form an association of supervisory unions mm -hmm. to deliver shared programs and services to complement the educational programs of member SUs in a cost-effective manner. And then here we go, an association formed it shall be known as a BOCES. Now we're just going to see the word BOCES everywhere. I'm on page six. And it shall be a body politic and corporate with the powers and duties afforded them under this chapter. Subsection B, articles of agreement. They're organizing and governing uh, documents. So agreements to form a BOCES pursuant to this chapter take the form of articles of agreement and serve as the operating agreement. Agreements have to include a cost benefit analysis outlining the projected financial savings or enhanced outcomes or both that the parties expect to realize through shared services or programs. Okay, this might be a question for Representative Boss. Boss uh, how do we, how do, how will they know that? I mean, in order for one of these to form, do you need to come to the table and say, hey, it's likely five of our teachers, we could, we could have one of our teacher now for these five districts and one German teacher for these five districts? Does it sort of need that to get started? I'm just trying to understand how they would know that the financial savings, what the projected financial savings would be. I may be missing. So I intuit that they, um, right now they're being forced to have these conversations yes. and when they are forced to have them, they will, I'm sure, bring their needs to the table. And if there are matching needs, then that provides the spark uh, for further uh, collaboration and cost-saving research. So what about, are we saying you have to, or is this just an option? We're saying that you have to consider it, but we're not saying that you have to do it. And I think you'll see, Senator Gambian, as we go through what is required in the Articles of Agreement, you'll see the level of detail that goes into what they need to think through to form. Thank you. Um, so no, so I'm on um, page six, line seven. No agreement or subsequent amendments shall take effect unless approved by the member SUs. Right, that makes sense. If you're going to be a part of the BOCES, you got to approve what you're signing up for. And the Secretary of Education. The Secretary shall provide articles of, uh, uh, shall approve articles of agreement if the Secretary finds that the formation of the BOCES is in the best interest of the state, the students, and the member SUs, and aligns with the policy set forth in Section 601, which is the first piece we walked through today. In the St. James, is it usually the Secretary or an agency that would approve articles of agreement like that? This is an anomaly. So this is the first, yeah. There's usually who would approve articles of agreement. So the um the U uh the union school district. You know, some other parts of government, yeah. Oh, other parts of government. Yeah. yeah. Uh yeah. I don't know off the top of my head. I, communication union districts are the first thing that's coming to yeah, mind. I yeah. can look that up for you. I don't know that. I'm off thinking the top about of my a core question. Okay. But um, for union school districts, um, the I believe um, the let's see. Okay. For union school districts, um. A study committee gets together of all the school districts that want to create a union school district. If they decide they want to create one, they transmit their study committee report and their proposed articles of agreement to the secretary, who then submits them with recommendations to the state board. And then the state board um, has to uh, approve the proposed union school district if it makes certain findings. And those findings, are almost exactly what I just read to you. It is in the best interest of the state, the students, and the school districts, and aligns with the policy for union school districts. So very similar, uh, but the state board is not involved in BOCES. It's just the secretary. Sir, if you I'm just going to do roll call. Okay. Right back. Thank you so much. I'm sorry, St. James. 
I thought I could serve. I thought it was like a state board of ed needs to approve. For union school districts, not for BOCES. BOCES is the Secretary of Education. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'm sorry, Senator Chief. Uh, I think just as a comment for the committee, I, I feel like phrase the best interests of the state could probably use some more refining. Uh, you know, two things. Yeah, it, it's it's a little vague, and I mean that you know, if two SUs are going to be working together, they're going to be working together in that region's interest, and it may have a neutral effect or a negative effect or a positive effect on the state. Uh, I, so I, I just I just feel like that's an area that could use some more refining or yeah yeah that's, that's a good one. thank you chair uh, I completely agree with Senator Hashim on that and I mean you could even question the term best interests of the students like which yeah. do this and and I think I think that whole that whole section needs us to dig into I think a little bit more. I agree with both, but it comes down to who's paying for the for the product. If it's you know, if it's coming out of the state education fund, then it's going back to the state. If it's the local school district or supervisory union, it's coming out of that the property taxes anyway. But so yeah. I guess you know who's paying for it. Yeah. We're not there yet. Again, I will just say, you know, obviously we can take testimony and, and refine that, but that language is taken out of the Union School District um, statute. So that language already exists um, in state law. Um, so if you are going to make changes to what best interest of the state means, we're going to have to be careful that we are not inadvertently impacting unless you want to, what that analysis would look like for the formation of a emerged school district, a union school district. Um, okay, so um, we're on line 14 on page six. So this is what, at a minimum, the articles of agreement have to include the names of the participating supervisory unions, the mission, purpose, and focus of the BOCES, the programs or services to be offered by the BOCES, the financial terms and conditions of membership of the BOCES, including any applicable membership fee, the service fees for member SUs and the service fees for non-member SUs as applicable. On page seven, the detailed procedure for the preparation and adoption of an annual budget carry forward provisions the method of termination of the BOCES and the withdrawal of member SUs, which shall include the apportionment of assets and liabilities, the procedure for admitting new members and for amending the articles of agreement, the powers and duties of the board of directors of the BOCES to operate and manage the association, um, including uh, board meeting attendance requirements, consequences for failure to attend a board meeting, conflict of interest policy, and a policy regarding board member salaries or stipends, and then any other matter not incompatible with law that the member SUs consider necessary to the formation of the BOCES. So a couple things I wanna point out. To get at your question about who pays for this, we're leaving it up to each individual BOCES to decide how they are funded. So, in the Articles of Agreement, they have to include financial terms and, and conditions of membership, including any applicable membership fee. So they could decide to have a membership fee or they could not decide to have a membership fee. And then they have to include service fees for member SUs or service fees for non-member SUs as applicable. So I think the testimony that the, the House Education Committee heard from other states was um, once these get up and running, they are largely operating as a fee-for-service program, right? So they're offering a service and people are buying it. So each BOCES has to decide for themselves, do you get a discount if you're a member? Or do you have to pay 
more if you're a non-member or does everyone pay the same? And um, it could be different for each BOCES depending on the needs of each individual region or programs and services that they are offering, right? If you are, uh, if you are that, if you are the one, if you have the one grant writer for the entire state, maybe you decide not to offer different fees for members or non-members, right? Because everyone in the state is using your service. But maybe three BOCES pop up grant writers. And so maybe some offer different fees for members versus some members and some don't in order to remain competitive. They have to figure that out themselves. The legislature and this bill is not dictating how they set that up. So if I may, uh, OC districts can, you can cross OC districts to get certain services. It's not as though you're creating something that might just live between your BOCES district. As you pointed out, the best grant writer is the Southeast corner. If you are a member, doesn't matter where you are, you can benefit from that grant writer. Yeah, so the bill says you can only be a member of one BOCES, okay. but you can purchase services from any of them. I see. Interesting. Yeah, Sarah, do it. Following up on what we're talking about right now, that I circled the word because it just struck me as a little bit odd, but I maybe it's because I'm not understanding fully. Um, it's on page six and uh, line sixteen. Um, the mission, purpose, and the focus of the BOCES. I understand mission. I understand purpose. Focus. I don't understand. Is each BOCES going to have a different focus? It could. It could. Their focus could be just as general as providing shared services for their members, mm -hmm. or it could be to provide quality continuing education for all Vermont like these teachers. And if a BOCES ends up accidentally doing work outside of its focus, I mean, is it, it would amend their articles of agreement. Oh, so this is, okay, it's very fluid, <laughs> very fluid and yeah, okay, got it, thank you. Right, so if they were, let's say they formed to provide three different services, <laughs> you know, if if a fourth service naturally flowed out of those three, they would have to look at their articles of agreement and decide is this just is this fourth service really just a part of services two and three, or is this really a brand new need that we are filling a new service that we are providing and do we need to update our articles of agreement? to reflect that. Yeah, please go for it. No, no, any questions? Um, is, will the BOCES be under the uh, under the umbrella of the school boards? And also, um, oh, sorry, I have a question. Um, should ask the other one, but are they? They have their own board of directors that they are. So they have yeah. their own board of directors, yeah. separate from the school board. I know. Are they subject to open meeting laws? Mm -hmm. uh, so did you have a corporate? They are a body politic and corporate, which is a legal term of art for when we're talking about kind of political subdivisions of the state. Um, and I just want to warn you all that they are doing roll call on the bill before the bill. So. Okay. Oh, they got through the bees. <laughs> they did. Uh, I see a potential conflict between region and specialism. Uh, I like the whole concept, but it seems like it's a path towards super unions, which frankly I support, okay? But this maybe isn't quite far enough. It's, that's first blush. You have a region versus a specialty. And if you said you could be a member of one BOCES, but you can purchase from any BOCES. Um, I don't know. It's going to require, a, a, you know, I know, okay, four week one way until, you know, it's got to go. This is a big deal. And I'm not, you know, part of me says it's not far enough. Part of me says that there's potential conflicts, un unintended consequences that I'm not quite sure we're, we've got to flesh out. I'm, I'm sure that in the House Committee, you know, they bumped into a lot of those. And, you know, if there's additional you know, kind of like sensitivities that we're not yet discovering, would be helpful to understand so we don't pay the same 
paved the same road that you guys did over the past two months. Right here. Oh, sorry. I was no. I was just thinking maybe we should keep going on the oh. bill. Maybe some of our questions will be answered. Um, if I would just offer, yes, <laughs> as always. Um, uh, you know, the House Education Committee heard a lot of testimony from education cooperatives in the state and from other states on how they operate it. And I found it as I was drafting this really helpful to understand kind of what services they're offering. What does that look like in each different state um, to kind of understand what this is, what this is actually meant to do. Um, so it may be that be very boring and unexciting enabling language to allow SUs to form these organizations to offer these services um, does not get at the heart of some of your questions of how does this work in the real world? And it's not until you hear from the folks who are actually working in these education collaboratives that you understand that, that you can answer some of those questions or maybe highlight some of your concerns. This language is just the scaffolding. I like to think I, I think I use this term um, in the house. It's the scaffolding that allows SUs to get together and form of OCs. It gives them a roadmap for how to do this. But it doesn't necessarily answer all of this legislation, doesn't necessarily answer all of your questions on how they will actually work. Right? So, like school districts. School districts, the mechanics and what goes into teaching or running a school district, there's so much more that goes into that than is just contained in Title 16, right? I'm constantly reminding you all, well, this is what it says in black and white. Don't I hear from the field on how they're actually doing this. Mm -hmm. I think this is a, a great example of that. Um, and the House had the benefit of looking at this bill after they had heard all of that testimony, mm -hmm. right? for months, and you all are having to look at just the boring structure, the boring scaffolding without hearing about any of like, oh, okay, well, I can see how that testimony about that program that this education collaborative was providing, I can see how the scaffolding would give some SUs the tools they need to be able to get together to form that kind of a program. Um, that they really go hand in hand. And this is meant to be, H630 is meant to be very kind of technical and not exciting about the work that the OCs are actually doing. Does that make mm -hmm. sense at all? Okay. Yeah, it does. I'm wondering, <clears throat> Representative Buss, if I may, as we're talking about this, and as what Ms. St. James just mentioned, mm -hmm. talking again, purchase power, maybe things that could help train teachers. Was there any discussion about just one process? Yes. In Montpelier or Bethesda, uh, where you do have, oh, you know, oh, <laughs> well, you know, one boast is where it is, that is the place where you might go. Yeah, I, I can just see some logic because really it, it is that it's a government structure. It's not, you could, I don't know, it just seems to me like it gives a big view of everything with purchase power. Um, I don't know, what, I'm just curious if you could just say something about maybe what that discussion looked like and why you all did go in that direction. Mostly we did not go in that direction because of the regionalization of transportation contracts, which could look very different from the south end of the state, the top of the state, from east to west. Also, extraordinary special education services um, in terms of finding a location and, and providing um, what the kids in that region need. Um, that felt to be something more regionally focused. Okay. Um, and that's not to say that any that all seven will be created, maybe two are created. Right. Because you might be right and that there only needs to be one. I Yeah, I don't know. It just yeah. I just keep thinking if if you know there were 
the board comprised of people from each of these districts. Uh, but I can also see your point. It could get a little bit, you know, you do have particular things in each district that are unique to each district, and um, you don't want those to disappear. Yes, Senator Weeks? When you said that, actually, earlier, I was thinking uh, the concept of why the AOE is not already doing this. <laughs> yeah, when you say yeah. one, one OC, I'm thinking, yeah, AOE. That's a BOCI, but I, I understand that, you know, the regional differences of regional focuses are necessary. But for example, procurement, you know, in a corporate world, we don't have, you know, every, every program, every uh, uh, unit doesn't have its own procurement arms. We, we, we move from the top down. I'm very sorry. Yep. Oh, we'll I will back. be back as right. soon right. as I am. Yep, we're going to work with All Representative right. Buss and then we can have questions. Thank for you. For your yes, yes. No, we understand. And that's why we had $600 camera yeah. to involve it. Oh, let's see. No. Oh, in terms of. Right. Well, that was a that was a young ago. That's that was, you know, it's fixed that by going to just in time logistics. Where they, I'm thinking about a policies as well. This policies has a corner on the toilet paper market mm -hmm. for all the schools. So you know they get they get the best deal. Where if it was AOE, they could buy it for everybody. And That's the, the way I'm get the best deal. Right. A little bit. All right, Bus, do you want to join us? Again? Sure. We'll just have some questions, and when we run out of questions, we'll take a break. Right. All right, let's cancel that. Um. So yeah, I, again, I just keep thinking, like you said, is there a way to, I don't know what others think, does it make sense for there to be one and not the other? But look at comments. Yeah. So I think it was last week or the week before, an AOE was in to testify. And we were, we were kind of talk to, talking about um, coaching and activating in the field because certain things are hard to grasp from a module that's on a website. And in order for you to figure out how to teach that module, you need some coaching. Mm -hmm. And it came up that that's not actually what they do, the AOE. And so I had zero idea that that was the case. And yeah. that made me appreciate um, the concept of the BOCES even more. Well, who actually know what they do? I mean, talk to tell Powell and what they do. It's a it's a great question. Yeah. yeah. So related to that, you're saying so if the BOCES would take on again, are you saying the BOCES would take on possibly teachers or teacher training, those kinds of things? Professional development. Professional development. development. Okay. That's right. Because traditionally that is uh, that the school district themselves will um, provide the professional development that their staff needs. And, and also uh, they, they choose to focus on it. You know, my district wants to be 90% proficient in literacy. Mm -hmm. And so they trained their, uh, the specialists to be able to coach everyone in the district. Mm -hmm. And then that started other supervisory unions go, oh, well, yeah. why can we just do what you're doing? Right. Mm -hmm. And the answer is kind of, but this makes it easier for them to do that. That's a great example where you all focused on that and then now others can adopt what you are doing. And maybe that wouldn't have happened if there had been one versus right? possible. Yeah. Other questions for Rep. Bus while we wait for Ledge Council. Otherwise, we'll take a break. Let's council this back. Just, Just to kind of finish this today. Yeah. A, a question that so, for example, um, agency of human services. Do they do the do the advertising and recruiting and onboarding of, uh, say, for example, an agency of education employee, or does the education the agency of education do their own hiring? Everybody just does their own hiring. Or is that yeah. something? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the one thing that I would love to see more, again, statewide is the, the coaching piece. You know, is there a way, again, 
we, we all know we've talked about the agency for a long time in this committee, the needs, is there a way, and I always think, wouldn't it be great if there were 14 people from the agency, one in each county, schools mm -hmm. got something going on, call the person from the agency, have that person come in. Um, I, I think that's the one area where I wonder how the BOCES would do it. Um, Based but, on their education. Okay. That's what I was just going to say, because the AOE, the, all their salaries are general funds, and when that's and then if we're using education dollars because we're training teachers uh that then is funneled through the SUs. So I feel it's a money flow thing as well. It, it's like the question you just asked asked. I asked the question was who's who's the HRO for the state? Is it is it the agency administration agency of administration? I'm sorry, the HRO the human resource. Oh office. They don't have it. Everybody just does their own thing. Well, I, I suspect the governor's office, the administration probably has one. We have one in the legislature, an HR person, you know, somebody that if, if all of a sudden you have a concern, but I'm not sure speak why. Yeah. Since we're having a pretty relaxed conversation, um, I speaking of we're thinking about a one BOCES uh, for the state, which is I think kind of a compelling and interesting thought, given that I've been told the number of students we have in our state is equivalent to or less than like a single district in a place like Texas or wherever. So I mean that's kind of an interesting thought. But uh, I do remember a few years back when we wanted to do like one single literacy program for the whole state. And the argument was we couldn't because it was too expensive. And I think it was like 23 million or something like that. So as much as I am I'm excited about this and open-minded, I just wonder if there's just always going to be bumping up to lack of resources to achieve what we really want to achieve. Just a statement, not really a question, but no, a question. We had similar discussions. The the number of OCS was the uh, the sticking point for all of us. None of us walked out of this bill thinking that that was, you know, the dead right answer to uh, what we should do here. I, I mean, I, I definitely hear where you're you're going. Why not just put it in one? Um, it's one enabling uh, entity, and then we all figure out from there if. And, and then maybe maybe this could be the flexibility in the language. Um, we really want to start with just one to see if, if everything can be done through one. And then if it cannot be done through one, then regionalize with a cap of seven. Um, that might be a way to, to do it, which really focuses it and kind of forces everybody to try to collaborate in that way. Because if you think of it, if you think about it, you're really, again, this is purchasing power, paper, desks, all that kind of thing. Other things, even transportation, could be worked from here. Uh, school construction could be worked. And it does give you that, again, sort of uh, statewide look around what areas are there real needs for school construction, what areas aren't, where are the districts that need this. So, that's St. James will do this, but I'm wondering, can you just tell us the makeup of the board for the BOCES, how that works? It's one member from each contributing supervisory union that can be either an appointee, a supervisor of the, of the superintendent, or a school board member. It could be like the PUC. Mm -hmm. So we could get ourselves into some conflicts. <laughs> <laughs> Could they could open up a? I mean, if it wasn't managed properly, mm -hmm. could it's a it's actually a very interesting point. If PUCs were each more local, maybe yeah. they maybe there wouldn't be as much conflict. We did put in there um, that the executive director and the treasurer would have a, an evaluation panel.
take 10 minutes. We'll wait for Ms. St. James to raise that one. Yeah, yeah, please. I, yeah. I'm finding it, given the environment of, uh, you know, the property tax issue and yeah. education funding and such, find it very refreshing that we're talking about efficiencies right. and saving yeah. money and not just, yeah. I know, where to go spend, you know, new tax. Money. Thank you. And if nothing else, it's, it's the beginning of a good plan. It could get further refined what are his vision for education in Vermont? Agreed. Yep. 